So I want to back up and maybe just share a little bit about where I'm at and how I got where I am and then, then try to break some things open to you. Um, and I shared some last time we were together, some testimony about how God basically broke me open and tore me apart and brought me back to life after a pretty long stint in hell. And yes, I do believe in hell. I have been there. I don't ever want to go back. Um, and I, I really believe that the Lord did a work of resurrection in my life. And um, at, at, this, at this stage, um, I, I, I have a sense of, of great gratitude um, and responsibility because the Lord preserved my life, brought me back to life, and has flooded me with, with his love in a way that I've never known before in all of my years as a Christian. Um, the love of God is such a real thing to me. It's a tangible reality in my life right now. And I have a burning missionary zeal to proclaim the gospel, to evangelize Christians <laughs> with the good news of, 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 of who, who this God really is and what he's like as, as he's been revealed to us through Jesus. Um, and, and not just Christians, but Christians need to hear the good news. <laughs> because they're believing a bunch of lies. They're, they're, they're believing a bunch of slander, a bunch of libel, slanderous mistruths about their father. <laughs> and, and because of that, they're afraid to really go to him and trust him completely and, and open their lives up in complete total abandonment because as First John 4, 17, I think is 19, perfect love casts out fear. But he who fears, fear is there because we're afraid. Fear has to do with punishment. I love, I love the Living Bible translation. It says the person who fears has not yet been convinced that God really loves them. It hasn't had that revelation yet that God is love. God doesn't just have love. God, God is love. Love is what God is. God doesn't just have love because if he had love, then he could, you know, maybe not have it or not have as much of it. But everything that God does comes from love. It's not that God has love and God has wrath. No, God has love, and, and everything he does comes out of it. So anyhow, so on September, September 17th, this past year, I was sitting in the morning, this beautiful early autumn day, sitting at my picnic table out in the backyard with my journal open, and, and I don't say this that often because I get frustrated when I hear people say, God told me this and God told me that. But, but I want to say the Holy Spirit really spoke to me. And he said, unfurl your sails because I'm about to blow fresh wind into your life and I'm going to take you places that you never would have dreamed possible. Those are the exact words. And I've got that written down in my journal. I know sep September 17th. And something changed. I mean, call it a shift in the wind. Maybe I just set my sails, and I, I actually had to go to dictionary.com and look up the word unfurl because it's not a word that I normally use. I'm not a sailor man, and, and I forget the exact definition, but it was really kind of cool that, that it, it, it's to open up and to release, you know, and God was saying to do that with my mind and with my heart, with my understanding, with my spirit. Open it up and release it, abandon it like you would do with a sailboat, a yacht. And you unfurl the suit, you're surrendering the sails to the wind. You're giving up control of the sails to the wind, saying, wind, take over. And then the, the wind comes in to take that boat where it never would have been able to go. Um, and that was September 17th. The Lord said something new to me in that same voice just this Monday. And he said, now it's time to take up the anchor. <laughs> and that really, that really hit me. Because I've had, I've had the, the, the sails open and the wind's blowing, but there was an anchor there. And the anchor was what was left of my bondage to or embedded, embeddedness to. Isn't that what an anchor does? It embeds itself at the bottom of the... It, it embeddedness to old theology, the old theological presuppositions. Um, I, I was... I was not raised... I was raised Roman Catholic, but... And then I got saved as a Jesus freak in the early 70s. But then when I got serious about ministry, I was trained as a Calvinist. And I went to seminary and I studied Calvin. And I was an evangelical Presbyterian church minister for years. And I was the chairman. I'm not 
as I said on Facebook, I'm not tooting my horn, but I think it's important that people know where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm not some Johnny fly-by-night coming up with these weird, silly ideas about God's love. I, mean, I'm, I, I know theology. I was the chairman of the theology committee for the Southeastern Presbytery. I used to write their position papers on Calvinism. I used to examine candidates who, who were coming out of seminary to determine whether they were fit to be Presbyterian pa pastors. I was the one who examined them. And so you're not Calvin enough, Calvinist enough. You know, you don't believe enough in the wrath of God <laughs> and double pre predestination. And you need to explain superlapsarianism, which is the doctrine of Calvin that's, that God actually foreordained Satan existence and the fall of man, Adam and Eve, that was planned by God so that God could show forth his wrath and his glory. So man never had a choice. The whole thing was a setup by God. That's Calvinism. So the Lord said, it's, you know, it's time to take up your anchor. Because with the wind blowing in your sails and with the anchor taken up, no telling where you're going to go. And that's exhilarating to me. It's, 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 it's scary in one sense, but it's also exhilarating. Um, and then in this journey, I'm, sa I'm saying all this before I share some things out of Romans with you. Just so you know where I'm coming from. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Um, somewhere along the line in this, in this journey, after the posse got going and I started really you know, stepping into more of a teaching role, um, I've gone way beyond administ administrating Facebook group um, in, into a real teaching role. And one of those mornings, the Holy Spirit challenged me and, and said to me, as I wrote it down in my journal, would you be open to consider the possibility that I'm actually a lot more loving and merciful than you ever would have imagined possible? Is it possible? <laughs> is it possible that God is actually more loving and, 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 and more compassionate and more merciful and more, here's, here's a scary word for conservatives, more inclusive, <laughs> that his grace is more expansive than what we would have ever imagined? Now, how do you say no to that? No, I will not consider that possibility that God is more loving than what I thought he was because there's no way God could be more loving than I think he is. <laughs> and that, that sounds ridiculous, but you know, um, you know what, what I do for fun is I, I troll fundamentalist religious groups on Facebook. <laughs> I love it. I, mean, I, spend, I spend almost as much time on, on these, these evangelical fundamentalist groups as I do on the posse. And I'm there. Stuff that I post with you guys, I'll throw it in there in some Baptist group. <laughs> and, and maybe I'm just a sadist. I don't know. But that's where I get Pastor Tim's. Y'all remember my thing Is with that Pastor Tim? Uh, that's where I get Pastor Tim at. <laughs> and he, I mean, he stayed with me for about three days, but he finally wrote me off, and I'm on my way to hell. <laughs> so is it possible that God is more loving and more compassionate, more inclusive and more expansive in his grace than anything that we could have ever imagined? And some people say, you know, and this, this is what blows my mind, Christians who have a hard time with somebody challenging them to think that maybe God is better than what they thought he was. I mean, if, he, if, he, if he's not better than what we thought he was, if that's not good to think that God's better than what we thought he was, then the opposite is, well, it's better to think that he's less than what we thought he was. That's the religious mindset. Well, God can't be that good because, and they throw all these scriptures at me. Well, what about this? And what about that? And what about, yeah, but okay. I mean, there's all kinds of things in the Bibles. I mean, I, I could justify anything in the Bible. I can, ju I can justify genocide. I can justify slavery. I can, I can justify um, rape and, 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 and sexual slavery. All of that's in the Bible. If you take it out of context, all kinds of stuff. Um, so don't just throw isolated verses to try to prove that God's not as loving as, as, he, as, as he really is. And then one last thing, and I'm going to jump into this. Um, and this is a scripture that kind of underlies a lot of this. Did this whole thing, is it possible that God could maybe be more loving than what we imagine possible? Why don't I just read it? In, in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, as Paul is praying for the Ephesians, he says, I'll just, yeah, oh, there you go. 
listen to this, Ephesians 3, and you know what, I'll, I will read this and this will be our prayer. Okay? We all agree with me? This will be our prayer right now. We're going we're gonna to ask the Abba of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit right now to do this. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, woo, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit so that Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him and your roots will grow down deep into God's love and make you strong and then you will have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide how long how high how deep is his love and may you experience the love of Christ that is too great to understand then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God so Paul is saying, he's praying and saying this, this love of God is, and, and he's, you know, I think he's borrowing language from, from David and, and the Old Testament prophets about as far as the east is from the west, as far as the heavens are above the earth. You know, that, that was the Hebraic way of saying infinite. They didn't have a word for infinite. Um, but they had a word for a concept of east and west. And if you go, if you go east and I go west, when do we meet each other? <laughs> it's never. God's love is, is, is so far beyond anything that we will ever be able to wrap our little puny, finite, fallen minds around. So is it possible that God could be more loving than what we're able to comprehend? <laughs> Duh! <laughs> He's God. <laughs> he is love. He is infinite. So how are we going to grasp hold of that and bring it down into our understanding and say, well, I'm going to build a systematic theology around what I understand to be the love of God, but I'm going to make sure I temper it with his wrath and his justice because you go into a, you go into a fundamentalist or an evangelical um, Facebook group or a church or a conversation, and you start talking about, as I'm about to really lay it on thick, you start talking about the expansiveness of the love of God and rather than them saying, hallelujah, isn't it wonderful that Abba loves us so much and he loves the whole world? Oh, if I say God loves, God is so loving, you would never believe how loving and how forgiving and how merciful. He, yeah, but remember, he's also holy. Yeah, but he has another side to him. It's his justice and his wrath. Now, you see that in Facebook, on our group. Now, I'm not going to name any names, but you see that every time I throw out stuff about, well, what about this? And would you? But have you read John 3.16 lately, brother? <laughs> like, yeah, I have. Um, why, why don't you just chill and just, first of all, allow the Holy Spirit to stretch and expand your ability to comprehend that he is more loving than you will ever, ever, ever have a clue. <laughs> okay? And, and let that be the guide. Let that interpret everything else in the Bible. Let the love of God through Jesus be the interpretive lens by which you make sense out of everything else.